Father God in heaven, we thank you, Lord. Lord, we lift you, we magnify you, we thank you, Father, for who you are, for what you do. God, we praise you, we honor you, and we bless your name for just being good and being God. Now, Father God, we realize that you are a good God. Matter of fact, Lord, you are the good God. And we honor you tonight. We praise you. We lift you, Father God, for who you are and for what you do. Now, Lord, we come, Father God, as empty vessels before a full fountain. Lord, we ask you to feed us, to bless us. Bless us, Father God, that we will be about your will, your word, and your way. It's in Jesus' name we ask you to speak to us through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Out of my way, God. Yes, he is. The God we serve is such a wonderful God. He has blessed us one more time, another again, to come to the house of prayer, the house of the Bible, the house of Bible study. Amen. Thank God so much for, for blessing us one more time to come together and worship him and to learn of his word. Amen. We are in chapter 2. The book Sharing the Gospel. The book is Sharing the Gospel. We're in chapter 2. We did half of this chapter, a little less than half of this chapter on last week. We will look to complete this chapter on tonight. If you participate with, with great anticipation and participate with enthusiasm. Amen. So we're in chapter 2 of of uh, sharing the gospel. Our chapter tonight is called Pinpoint. This chapter, chapter two, is called Pinpoint. There are five P's to effective evangelism. How many are there? Five. There are five P's to effective evangelism. Those five P's are? Prepare. Prepare. Pinpoint. Pinpoint. Personalize. Personalize. Picturize. Picturize. And prescribe. Okay, put your paper down. Look at me. Give me the five P's to effective evangelism. One more again. The first one is? Prepare. Two. Pinpoint. Three. Picturize. Four. Personalize. And? Prescribe. My goodness, y'all stumble worse than the children do. My goodness, y'all don't look at this stuff between week to week, do you? Prepare. Pinpoint. Personalize, picturize, and prescribe. Why can I just say it and you can't say it? Why why can't I say it and you why can't I say it and you can't say it? My goodness, have mercy. There are five P's to effective evangelism, and we on which one tonight? We on chapter two, we're looking at pinpoints. Bring us up to date to where we are tonight based on chapter 2 alone. We know in chapter 1, prepare is the longest lesson and it's the most important part of the five Ps, right? It is the most important. Why is it most the most important? Why is it the most important? The soul winner has to be prepared. We must be prepared. The soul winner must be prepared. You have to be prepared. Matter of fact, even during your soul winning experience, you need to spend 90% of your time in preparation and 10% of your time in actually sharing the gospel. So 90% of your time ought to be in preparation. Preparation includes prayer, praying the word and praying over the word. What's the difference in the two? Praying the word and praying, praying over the word. Boy, pages start slipping. That tells me one thing. Somebody got some notes. That's one thing. That's the good thing about this. So, so let's see. You have 90% of your time spent in preparation. 10% of your time spent in actually sharing the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because you must be prepared. Now you got your page turned to my question. What's my question? You're going to tell me the difference between praying God's word and praying over God's words. What's the first one? Praying God's word. Well, what are we saying when we pray God's word? You're going to repeat God's word back 
back to him. When you're going to tell God what God has said, nothing, absolutely nothing gets a parent's attention more than his or her child repeating what that parent has said in living out what that parent has said. A parent is amazingly proud whenever his or her child repeat what he has said or she has said and his or her child act out what he or she has said. So when we look at the Word of God, we study the Word of God, we're going to pray the Word of God. So we're telling God what God has said. Because it's power in God's Word, not our words. Amen? The power is in God's Word. Amen? Amen. So when we pray God's Word, we're praying the power. We're praying the conviction. We're praying uh, the celebration. We are praying his promises. There are over 1,000 promises, over 1,100 promises that God has promised a believer. And so we have to pray God's word. We have to tell God in our time of prayer. Tell God what God has told us. Okay, so what is praying over God's word? We know that praying God's word is repeating to God what God has said and repeating to others what God has said. So what is praying over God's word? Somebody else? Anybody? Study God's word. Pray, we're praying over his word. When we approach his word or before we approach his word, we're going to tell God, God be with us. God speaks to, speak to us. God, make yourself clear what you have said. God bless us by way of your word. That's why the psalmist says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My God, my Redeemer. Amen? So we ought to pray over God's word. The word of God ought to be something we speak and the word of God ought to be something we keep in our heart. So we're praying over God's word. That's part of preparation, right? Not only that, when you deal with preparation, you want to study God's word. The reason why the Jehovah's Witnesses put Christians on a run is because they don't know God's word. Because Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide are studying the same thing at the same time. Our Sunday school books got chapter 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 5 of, of Matthew one Sunday, and then they've got chapter 10 of Isaiah the other Sunday, and then some Sundays we're on a different page altogether. We're in a different te uh, uh, we're in a different uh, testament, a New Testament and Old Testament. But the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have it down. Worldwide, they're saying the same thing. And when you ask them questions, everybody got the same answer. I didn't say they were the right answers. I said everybody got the same answers. What would it be like if every Christian would have the same answer every single time? The same answer. If we knew the same material, if we studied from the same Bible and we had the same answers, what would it be like? It would be a powerful moment, day after day after day after day. There will be a moment during the day. What would it be like if every Christian prayed at, at the same time every day? Bombarded heaven every day. Same time. Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, the angels would be busy. Now, I understand that we have different schedules, but we got those schedules. Those are our schedules, right? What if we all got on God's schedule? I used, for example, in the past that Hakeem, Elijah Wan, held up the whole celebration, the whole parade, because he had not talked to his God, and he was going to spend time talking to his God regardless of what the parade did. And he held it up. I don't know how long he held it up, but he held it up. The whole world was waiting on the rockets parade to begin, and you got this one Muslim that's talking to his God. 
What if we were so adamant about it that we wouldn't let stuff cloud, crowd us and, and cloud our minds and, and frustrate us to the point where we wouldn't take talk to our God that seriously? He wasn't embarrassed about it. And guess what? The news media waited on him. The floats in the parade waited on him. Because he is adamant about talking to his God. We got to become adamant about talking to God. You ought to have a, a, a place of prayer. You ought to have a time of prayer. And then you ought to pray all day week, all week long, all day long. You ought to talk to God. If more people would spend time talking to God, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in. We wouldn't have fly, flags flying around saying Trump or death. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have churches being invaded if we had spent time talking to God. Little boys walking around with guns, 15, 16 years old, destroying their lives, killing people, destroying families. But if they would spend time just with the Lord, they wouldn't have that attitude. So preparation is very important. The soul winner must understand that he or she have, has an urgent message. And this message is so urgent because the situation is critical. Your message is urgent. Your message is something that everybody needs. Everybody needs your message, but it has to be the right message. That's the other thing about the Jehovah's Witnesses. They got the same message, and to them, it's the right message. We have 18 different ways to get to heaven. We're so confused, we come up with 18 different ways to get to heaven. And because Oprah says it, it's right, that's the conclusion we come to. Because Oprah said there are several ways she forgot about the, the basic things that they taught her in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. She forgot it. But we know there's only one way to get there. And that's through Jesus. Jesus is Christ. We're busy arguing about whether the Church of Christ is right, the Church of or the Pentecostal Church is right, the Baptist Church, the Church of God in Christ, the Church of God, or the Church of God and Worldwide Association. We're concerned about who is right when people are dying and going to hell. We can't even come to the conclusion on how we are to be saved. So that's why our message is so important. The situation is critical. The message is urgent. We must win souls for Christ. Anything else you know about uh, prayer? Anything that I missed here? Anything else about the prayer? Okay, I'll move on. We're in pinpoint. In pinpoint, the soul winner focuses on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He serves in the capacity of a paramedic. The soul winner checks the patient's vital signs. The soul winner analyzes the patient's condition. And the soul winner transports the patient to the great physician. Who's the great physician? Jesus Christ, the great physician. And once they get to Jesus, Jesus can perform medical treatment. Pinpoint. Last week we talked about the fact that you need to understand that, that you are an opportunist. What's an opportunist? You ought to be an opportunist. Anybody? Look a way to share. Okay, so you, you're looking for a way to share Christ. You, you're looking for opportunity. You, you know that God is all about your availability and not your capability. Because we can do all the work that we can possibly think of, and then guess what? If the Spirit of God doesn't lead them, they won't even come to Christ. So God wants our availability to be present. This is a spiritual warfare, isn't it? The devil is an author of confusion, is the author of confusion. 
So tonight we will begin with the diagnosis, di diagnostic examination. <clears throat> the diagnostic examination. I need someone to get Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Who's that? 1 Peter 3, 15. And John 3, 16 through 17. Volunteers, please. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Yes, ma'am. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Reading from uh, New King James Version, that if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, so we understand that Jesus is the focus, right? Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the way men come to Christ. I said to a lady, I said to a group of people in a session that uh, if you have been saved in any way other than through Jesus Christ, you are not saved. That's pretty mean to me, huh? Does that mean? Does that mean to me? If you came to know, if you became a Christian, other than through Jesus Christ, number one, you're not a Christian. Number two, you are not saved. Jesus is the only way to, to be saved. He's the only way to be a Christian. The key word here, the root word is Christ. We are Christ-like. Christians, Christians, we are Christ-like. And in this spiritual warfare, we need to understand that Christ fights our battles for us. That's why we don't have to get into fight over the word of God. We just defend the word of God. Who has 1 Peter 3, 1 through 15 for me? 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses, verse 15. Verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sister Brown. Yes, ma'am. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify the Lord God. Know that God is holy. We are unholy. Set God aside in your heart from all the other clutter. Make sure that God is real in your heart. And make sure you're ready to give an answer. There's a book called Ready Defense. Ready Defense. You got to be ready to give your defense at any given moment. You got to be ready. You must be ready to give a defense of what you believe in your heart. Your convictions. On Sunday morning, our Sunday school teachers stand with a book, a Sunday school book. But really, it's their responsibility to tell people their convictions. Their convictions. When a preacher stands and preach, he has the word of God before him. And many of us have messed up the word of God. But it's our responsibility to give men, women, boys, and girls our conviction of the Christ. We have to share our convictions and what God has done. So you got to be ready to give an answer. Don't run from it. Be ready. Don't be shy about it. Say, oh, you know, I don't talk in public. I'm kind of I'm, I'm kind of introvert. <laughs> be ready. That's why for the last two, two Sunday Bible studies, Sister Davis had to be ready. And now she's ready from now on. She's ready. Have to be ready to give an answer. Of what God has put in you. Your conviction of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who has John 3, 16 through 15. Through 15 John 3, 16 through 17. John 3. John chapter 3, 16 through 17. Let's read it. Don't recite it for me. Read it to me. Remember, we want God's word, right? We want whose word? God's word. Okay, Brother Mouse. 
Yeah, John 3, 16 through 17. Yes, sir. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, so Jesus' whole purpose for coming to the world is to save us. Remember, we talked about the word so. Not in, the word so is not a measurement of how much God loves us. Because the word so is really dealing with the fact that Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness. The people were getting bit by snakes, right? And as they got bit by snakes, God said to Moses, go and raise up a bronze serpent in the wilderness. When you raise up the serpent, anybody who looks up at this serpent with hope will be healed. And therefore, John says, so as Moses has raised up the serpent, so God so raised up Jesus so we can be healed. That's where we get John 3.16. So God so loved the world. God loved the world so. So as Moses... So as God has raised up Jesus. So as Moses has raised up the serpent, so as God has raised up Jesus. Questions, comments? For Jesus came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus Christ might be saved. Look at the diagnostic examination. <clears throat> Look, scan... Search, diagnose, and examine every opportunity. Examine every opportunity God places before you. Every opportunity that God places before you. Do not attempt to force your way into the heart of the patient or the patient's heart. Don't make that attempt. Give me an example of somebody that you've seen or heard of that tried to make an attempt to force his or her way into the heart of an unsaved person. Anybody got any examples? Any examples? Tried to force. Let me give you an example as you as you think about it. Wood Ridge High School, I was a leader, a leader in, in Christ on Campus and Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So the lady in, in Christ on Campus and I decided one Saturday we're going to take the the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Christ the Campus, put them together and go to what was known then as Sharftown Mall. And we're going to go to Sharftown Mall and we're going to witness. Witnessing was going really well, but one lady tried to stop a boy, a teenager. He didn't want to talk about it. He went around her. She ran in front of him, got in front of him again. He went around her. Then she jumped in front of him again as if she was going to make him listen. And I politely said, sister, let him go. We can't force them. What does the Bible say? When you bring this good news of the gospel, no one accepts it, what do you do? Shake the dust off, keep going. So it's our place to present it, but it's not our place to make people eat it or accept it or take it. Do not attempt to force your way into the, the patient's heart. Allow God to open the door and walk through the door with confidence. Allow God to open the door. And when God opens the door, you just be ready to walk in with confidence. Be excited about it and know that God is with you. Forceful entry into a wounded heart could induce a fatal heart attack known as total rejection. If you push your way in, people are going to continue to reject you. But if you wait till God opens the door, even on your job, even in your church, even in your community, God has a way of opening the door. And when God opens the door, you step in. Don't you force your way in. You just step in when God opens the door. Because you don't want to wound a heart. Because hearts are already wounded. How many people you know just going through something right now? Do we live in a, a, a utopia world? A utopian world? Or do we live in a wounded, messed up world? Wounded, messed 
We live in a wounded world. And it's not our responsibility to further wound individuals. But God, the Holy Spirit, God is an intelligent being. He knows what he's doing. He has appointments for us. And in this appointment that he has for us, he's going to open the door. We don't have to argue about it, fuss about it. Some people get to arguing and fussing and start cussing about the Bible. Forcing their way in. When I, when I first came to Houston, I had my bachelor's pad. And this guy at the job, you know how, this is how they begin. They say, well, I'd like to come over and study the Bible with you. Well, I didn't. I didn't know he was a Jehovah's Witness. He says, I want to come over and study the Bible. Oh, man, come on, let's study the Bible. He was, he was a big, tall guy, thick guy. He came over, and I had bought my brand-new glass table from the flea market. $89. That included the, the table, the glass, the four chairs. Brought me a brand-new glass table, my first bachelor's pad, my first glass table. We sitting at the table talking. And every time he said something, I said, that's not what my Bible says. He said something else, I said, that's not what my Bible says. And after a while, he put all his weight on my glass table. Man, you ain't listening. Well, brother, we may be able to work together, but we're not going to study together. It's time to go. Time for me to walk you to the door. He can't force it on me. We can't force it on people. And now we have um, the the black Israelites. And man, are they aggressive. I mean, they are totally, and if you don't agree totally with what they say, they will flat get violent. That's not our cause. Our cause is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And present it in a way where it is it is. We're, people are able to take it. We can't force it in. A few weeks ago, there was a, there was a preacher standing and preaching, and about four, I think four or five boys walked in, and they sit near the back. The preacher was an ex-cop, so he, he noticed that they had guns on them. They came in, sit at the back of the church. The preacher was up preaching, and he kept preaching, and he walked all the way to the back while he's still preaching. And ask them why y'all here. Who sent you here? And ask them, can I pray for you? Now what if he had gone off on them? Those boys may have shot up the place. But he calmly walked back there. And when he got back there, he approached them boldly with confidence. And he politely prayed for them and had the men of the church to surround them. And pray for them. As somebody else called the police. I've been in that situation. So, did the church do wrong? They accepted prayer. But mouth, they accepted prayer. Did they have to call the police on the guy? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Why? Why, brother mouth? <laughs> <laughs> Why? I know you got a little excited there, didn't you? <laughs> why had to call? Why had to go and call the police? The boys accepted prayer. It's a dangerous situation. That's what I'm telling you. The situation is dangerous. This thing about winning souls to Christ. Let me tell you, the situation is critical. That's why our message is so urgent. And if the spirit of the Lord had not led the preacher to handle it the way he handled it, it could have become more and more dangerous. It didn't have to end that way. It ended in a beautiful story. And they went to jail. I told you before, my brother-in-law used to work for Harris County in the juvenile department. Juvenile department. And when the guys coming in found out, hey, that's a preacher. He's a preacher, man. He's a preacher. Everyone that came in and door, hey, man, I, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I'm saved now. Only when they found out he was a preacher did, were they calm enough to talk about Jesus. So his reply was the same to all of them. He said, yeah, you're saved. 
that means you won't go to hell, but you going to jail. Are you with me? So we have to live by the consequences. We got consequences to everything we do. But our goal is to reach men for Jesus Christ. Forceful entry into a wounded heart could introduce a fatal heart attack, total rejection. Not only is this total rejection toward you, but it's, it's really God that they're rejecting. Waiting for God to pinpoint the opening, waiting for God to pinpoint the opening into the heart will better ensure a successful outcome. We got to wait on God. You know, it, it was a thing a while back. I don't know if people still do this, but when they get saved, they want to set the world on fire with Jesus Christ. Everybody going to hell but them. Now that I'm saved, I'm going to send all y'all to hell. You can't, you can't smoke anymore. You can't sin anymore. You can't drink anymore. You can't participate in anything anymore. And if you do, you going to hell. But the fact of the matter is, the only way to miss hell is through Jesus Christ. Rejecting Jesus Christ is the only way to go to hell. If you confess Jesus Christ, you can miss hell. So people ask the question all the time. Well, what does he say when he died? Do we really know? Well, he did this and he never got a chance to repent. Well, we do things every day and we don't get a chance to repent. Man driving down the road at 75 miles an hour in a 60 mile an hour speed zone, he crashes and kills himself. Did he go to heaven? He didn't get a chance to repent from speeding. Did he go to heaven or did he go to hell? We don't know because the fact of the matter is God knows if one is saved. Because there are a lot of people around here acting like they're saved. But God knows if they're saved. And since God is the one that knows if they are saved, God is the one that knows if they're not saved. But what we can say with confidence, without Jesus Christ, they are not saved. Yes? Waiting for God to pinpoint the opening into the heart will better ensure a successful outcome. Diagnostic procedure. The effective soul winner must identify the primary procedure and source of recovery. Let me explain that. Although the soul winner is not perfect, remember, the soul winner is not perfect. We ought not carry ourselves as if we are perfect. We are not perfect. The soul winner is not perfect. Although he's not perfect, he or she, he or she should remember that his or her patient is wounded. He or she must remember that his or her patient is wounded. He or she is searching for an answer to his or her ailment. These people are sucking. I don't care who it is. I don't care if they say they don't believe in God. When the rubber meet the road and they think up in hell, down in hell, rather, they're going to lift their eyes. Guess what? They're going to confess Christ. When they, when they know they're about to get out of here. I've had several of deathbed confessions where people well, I've done everything else. Let me try God. And they come to Jesus on their deathbed. The question becomes, well, they just received Christ two minutes before they left here. Did they go to heaven? Yes, they went to heaven because, guess what? They confessed Christ. Now, many of us brag about our tenure. You know what about tenure years? We brag about our tenure. How long? I've been saved, sanctified, and woo, filled with his precious Holy Ghost for 40 years. 
So the guy that just confessed Christ and the guy who's been with Christ for 40 years, they both go to heaven. Is it fair? In your spare time, read Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, Jesus tells a story about a man who was the owner of some fields. <clears throat> and he went out to pick up laborers. And he picked up some people early in the morning, and he picked up some around noonday, picked up some around the third, fourth of the day, and then picked up some right at the end of the day. And he promised that they gonna, he was going to pay them a certain amount. And when the end of the day came, he paid all of them that certain amount which he promised. And guess what? All of them got the same amount. And they act just like you all do. I've been working all day. They just got here an hour ago. I've been working eight hours. Is, is it fair that they get the same amount of pay? Jesus keeps his promise. God keeps his promise. And God promises you and God delivers. There's a message. Don't compare yourself with anybody else. I worked in a chemical plant and went one year they decided that they had a surplus. They, got, they had to get rid of it. So they decided to give it to the employees. So every employee got $1,200. Across the board. Everybody got twelve hundred extra dollars on their paycheck. Hallelujah, glory! But they took out three hundred for tithes in all. <laughs> no, they took out three hundred for taxes. <laughs> See, God—they should have taken it off the top for tithes and all. But they took out three hundred off the top, so everybody brought home nine hundred dollars. What do you think happened when the word got out? That the managers, the supervisors, the foremen, as well as the laborers, everybody took home the same amount. What do you think happened? What's the human thing that happened? They complain. What do you think they said? They said, well, he's on a high pay scale, and there's no way that the same taxes I'm paying, he should be paying. I was sitting in the corner smiling. Thank God for the $900 I didn't have. And because people complain, they never gave another, they rather pay the government and let it go back than to start a ruckus again. No one got another $900. No one got another $1,200. That's what's happening in Matthew chapter 20. People complain because somebody got more than you have. Or somebody got more than I have. And I'm going to complain about it. I'm going to file a grievance. Now you file a grievance over somebody else's money. First of all, it's, it's the money that belonged to the man that's giving it out. And he can give his money to anybody he want to give it to. Amen? So we have to understand that it may not seem fair. But at the end of the day... Is the choice that God has made. And when it's a choice that God has made, you say, God, I thank you for allowing me to get to heaven, and I thank you for allowing my brothers and sisters to come, and you leave it at that. See, we're trying to be the recipient, and we're trying to be God. But God has this thing figured out. We just have to do our part. And when we look at the fact that the soul winner hears of herself, they're not perfect either now. We may have come along a few days earlier and, and met Jesus Christ, but the fact of the matter is, people are hurting and we were hurting too. Matter of fact, we still hurt. And we all need Jesus. The soul winner is the great physician's assistant. The soul winner is a great physician's assistant. The soul winner is the assistant to the great physician. The patient trusts you for a referral to the great physician. 
The person that's unsaved is trusting you that you will refer that person to the great physician. Don't spend your time talking about your story. Talk about his story. The great physician who is Jesus the Christ. Only the great physician can perform open heart surgery. Only the great physician can perform open heart surgery. That brings me to Melissa. We have a volunteer for Melissa. We have a volunteer, a voluntold person. <laughs> we have a volunteer to introduce us to Melissa. I'm going to ask that volunteer to come on up and tell us about Melissa. Remember this now. Open heart surgery can only be done by Jesus, who is the great physician. So we're going to see what Melissa is all about. Good evening. Uh, this is Melissa. Now, Melissa is the child of Pastor and Sister Davis, but I'm babysitting her today. <laughs> so, Melissa has a problem. She has a disease called sin. And that disease works, it's a disease of the heart. Yes. And so, Melissa needs a heart transplant. That transplant can only be performed by the great physician, Jesus Christ. So my purpose today, even though this is Pastor and Sister Davis's child, because she's in my care and she is having some problems, I can also refer her to the doctor. I can present her to introduce her to the great physician and have him work on her and cure her problem, which is her sin that is uh, that has affected her heart. And that physician can do the job and take care of Melissa's problem. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Melissa. She has a heart problem. Sister so Brown said, while well, she's babysitting, she's going to get her saved. <laughs> and that's each of our responsibilities. And the reason why we have to consider every child our child or every patient our child or every unsaved person our child is because we put great joy into helping our children. We don't ever want our child to go hurting. We don't ever want our child to go to hell. And so if you view every person, every unsaved person as your child, then you would have no choice and you would do it with excitement and conviction to get that person to the great physician. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sister Brown, for doing an excellent job. Um, we're going to bring her to you whenever she acts up. <laughs> Let's look at the major surgical procedure. While performing the major surgical procedure, the great physician is in constant communication with his team of technicians. Every single doctor, while performing surgery, is always in touch and in tune with his or her different technicians, nurses, other doctors, so Jesus is always in tune with us. But we have to always be in tune with Jesus. Accordingly, it should be with the soul winner and the unbeliever. Not only should we allow Jesus to be in tune with us, not only should we be in tune with Jesus, we need to be in tune with the patient. We need to keep in touch with these people. We need to make sure if a person have had open heart surgery and they can't get along by themselves, you got to walk them through the journey. This is not something that you just get a person saved and you say, hey, you're on your own. You got to nurture them. You have to feed them. 
You have to walk with them. So the thing that after evangelism comes discipleship. You have to nourish a person in the middle of their new life. This is a new life to them. They've never seen it before. They've never tried it before. They've never done it before. Good communication is a major factor in soul winning. We must keep in communication. Zero in on what God is doing through you to assist in cutting out sin's dominion over a life. God is doing something in you. God is still performing surgery on that person. God is using you to help eradicate the sin. You got to make sure you keep yourself in position that God can use you. You can't go back to what you used to do. You got a patient that's dependent on you. You got to make sure that God continues to use you. Stay alert and be careful observing the unbeliever's condition. Always be an observer of the unbeliever's condition. Make sure that this person that has just found Christ is strengthened and you can play a major role in that. Do not pinpoint, next statement is, pinpoint the issues of life that are relevant to the patient's deteriorating condition. Every person has a deteriorating condition, right? Right? That condition is sin. And sin tears a person apart. After Adam and Eve sin, men start dying. And the further we get away from Adam and Eve sin, guess what happened? Men die earlier. Who lived the longest that we know of on record? Methuselah. Methuselah. How many years? Let me see if I got some Bible students. How many years, we just passed Revelation, I mean Genesis, right? How many years, how many years did Methuselah live? 969. 969 years, is that right? Yeah. Is she right? So she got a check for the night? So Methuselah lived 969 years. How many people do you know in your lifetime have lived, has lived 969 years? Not one? So the longest that some people know of is like 120, I guess. Do you know of any that have lived longer? So sin has a way of causing men death. And not only is it physical death, but it's spiritual death. And spiritual death is when we disconnect it from God. God can't get to us. We can't get to God. There's a void between us. Only Jesus can bridge the gap. Jesus alone is the one who can bridge that gap. Sustain. So Jesus alone can bridge that gap. Amen? So open heart surgery, the surgery itself does some damage. You know that? The surgery itself does damage. We got to walk with them. Stick with them. Pinpoint the issues of life that are relevant to the patient's deteriorating condition. Do not be overzealous and overwhelm him or her by biblical principles and preachy remarks. Because once we think we got it, we got a way of throwing that Bible at them. We got some biblical principles that can, there again, the word of God brings man to Christ. The Holy Spirit leads man to Christ. Because you preach to them doesn't mean that your preaching statements and phrases are going to get them any closer. Matter of fact, it may make them run away. So don't use too many overwhelming biblical principles and preachy remarks. Remember, you are not acting independently of the great physician. You're not acting on your own. You're not acting by yourself. You're not independent of the great physician. You need to remain in close supervision of the great physician. Who needs to supervise you? The great physician. Who's the great physician? Jesus Christ. And the great physician is one who has never lost a case. Let me tell you, Jesus has never lost a case. If we allow God to allow us 
We allow God to, to lead us into doing the right thing the right way, with the right attitude, the right focus, then God can lead men and grab them at their hearts. Final paragraph for tonight. The ongoing treatment plan. There has to be an ongoing treatment plan. A soul winner can share personal testimony as a witnessing tool. The soul winner, and then chapter 3 will tell us more about it, but the soul winner can share his or her personal testimony as a witnessing tool. As a witnessing tool. That's why 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15 says, Be ready to give an offense. A defense. Be ready to give a defense of your conviction. Be ready to tell somebody about Jesus. Use your personal testimony as a witnessing tool. It can serve to encourage the newborn child in Christ. You want to encourage them. You always want to encourage them. However, the best testimony is the salvation story. The very best testimony is the salvation story, which is the story of Jesus Christ. And when you tell the story of Jesus Christ, he saves souls and causes men to change. Let me tell you, Jesus knows how to save the soul and Jesus will call me and cause men to change. If any patient goes off on another tangent or diverts your attention elsewhere, let him or her talk. You know, let them, let them talk for a while. Let them talk. Let them tell it. It's because the devil has a way of sabotaging your witness. So let them talk for a while. Keep in mind that it takes a great deal of courage to confess one's faults to another. So they may paint a picture of them being goody two shoe, and you know they're not. But let them talk. It takes a lot of courage to confess your faults one to another. Listen attentively. Listen. Listen attentively. And do not interrupt or dismiss what they're saying. Don't discount what they're saying. They're telling their story. Don't you discount what they're saying. Don't interrupt. Don't dismiss it. Wait until the patient finishes and gently interject and call the patient's attention back to the matter at hand. What's the matter at hand? Jesus Christ. Jesus is all that matters. <laughs> and it's your responsibility to turn the conversation back to Jesus. The soul winning Christian should maintain control of the soul winning experience. Do not allow the devil to sabotage your witnessing encounter. Don't let the devil sabotage your witnessing encounter. See, the devil wants to shut it down. The devil doesn't want men, women, boys, and girls to hear anything about Jesus. The devil wants to shut it down. He wants to sabotage it. And he wants you to get caught up on stuff. Stuff that really doesn't matter. He wants you to get caught up on it. But remember, your job is to have a ready defense. Your job is to be ready to present the gospel. Your job is to be ready to talk about your convictions of Jesus Christ. It is about Jesus and Jesus alone. Your story is good. You may want to write this down for test. This is, good. This is a good test statement here. Good thing to remember. Need to remember this. Regardless of how good your story is, Jesus' story is what saves souls. It doesn't matter how good and how powerful your story is, it's Jesus' story that saves souls. The next statement is even more important. It is Jesus' story that saves souls. It doesn't matter how, regardless of how powerful your soul is. 
Your, your, your story is, it's Jesus' story that saves souls. It's Jesus' story, right? Whose story is it? It's Jesus' story. It's the story of Jesus Christ that saves soul. It's Jesus' story that saves soul. Whose story is it? Jesus' story. It's Jesus' story that saves soul. This is my statement. The most I want to make sure I say it crisply and clearly. The, uh, the greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. The greatest miracle you will ever see is the saving of a lost soul. The greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. Healing you from AIDS is great, but it's not the greatest miracle. Healing you from cancer is awesome, but it's not the greatest miracle. Healing you from a bad lifestyle is an awesome thing, but it's not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. Because your soul is what determines whether you go to heaven or hell. If your soul is not anchored in the Lord, you can talk about how your, 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 your waves keep on coming. You can talk about how bad things get. But you need to talk about your soul and your patient soul. Yes? That's why at the end of every Bible study, at the end of every Sunday school class, at the end of every, every service, we extend the opportunity to somebody, for someone to experience the greatest miracle. And we do that tonight. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended for you to get to be a part of the greatest miracle that one will ever experience. And that is the saving of a lost soul. To bow your head with me and confess Christ as your Savior. If you never confess Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know Jesus. Believing that he died for our sins, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose early that third day morning. You bow your head with me and say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving my soul. And I know you only save us because we believe the story. We believe that you are the Son of God. We believe that you died for our sins. We believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe that you're now born again. We believe that you are on your way to heaven. We believe that you're saved. And regardless of what goes on from this day forward, you are born again. And we look forward to rejoice with you in heaven. Father, we thank you for this presentation. We thank you for blessing us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask you, Father God, to touch our hearts. Touch the hearts of so many others. Bless us, Father God, to be about your business. Lord, we ask you to bless our church and bless all those who suffer. Heal and touch, deliver, and deliver in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask you to make it right. Give us somebody encouragement to move on to. Encouragement to continue to walk with you. And bless us tonight as we come to sing unto you and glorify your name. Lord, we ask you to bless everybody on our prayer list and those that have not been mentioned. We ask you, Father God, to fix us in the midst of our bereavement. Give us hope and give us strength, Father, that we don't give up. 
Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is often time if you want to give to our church, you can do so electronically by giving to Zale, by way of Zale. Our Zale account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Amen.